the the last thing that I wanted to make sure I asked you a bit about was free will and determinism, because I, I know you wrote a book called How Physics Makes Us Free. So because I have a, a couple of episodes coming out in, in the near future as well that will be on these topics, I wanted to make sure I asked you a bit about it. But so I don't know if you if you find this annoying to go this far back, but how you, just for our listeners, how you like to describe determinism in a nutshell and the problem it at least ostensibly uh, puts for free will. Okay. Um, this has been on my mind because I've been like so many of the people that have been thinking about this stuff, um, you know, hearing a lot about Sapolsky in his book. So the way that I addressed it in that book and the way that I think is more natural in some parts of philosophy and the, the way that engages most directly with physics is in terms of physical determinism. So the idea is that you, um, the physical, so I'll give you the consequence argument, which I still find the most compelling argument, um, uh, which says physical laws. And again, put quantum mechanics aside for the minute, just address it in a purely classical setting. Um, you know, physical laws are deterministic. That means you can derive from the, phys the state of the universe at any given time the, and the physical laws that state in any other. Um, that means that, I'll state the argument now, that means that uh, you can, no, I'll, I'll state, sorry, I'm going to state the argument a little bit more clearly, taking that as the definition of determinism. Past is fixed and out of our control. Laws are fixed and out of our control. Determinism entails that um, the that the future is entailed as a matter of logic from the physical laws plus the past. Therefore, the future is fixed and out of our control. That's kind of the the usual way of presenting it. I talk about it in a slightly different way, but but the way that what I did in my book was um, sort of take apart the pre the kind of metaphysical presumptions that go into that way of setting it up. And the way that I would put it now is um, different than the way that I would put it in the book, the right way to understand it. Um, should I say something about that? Yes, please, please. So I think the, the simplest way to say it is we've got this picture and this is a way that connects. So again, this isn't what I said in my book, except in a, in a less focused way. But now I think of it, if, if you take physics seriously and you take in particular relativity seriously, then you realize something that um, is kind of built into the way that the consequence argument is set up is not a part of physics. So the way that we normally think of um, of the world, that is pretty theoretically, we think, you know, there's this kind of, the world is this big spatially extended object and it has a state at one time and a state at other times and its state in the past is fixed. And what determinism tells us is, so we kind of picture the world as this great big spatially extended evolving object. And what, and we think that what determinism tells us is effectively as soon as God put down, you know, or specified the positions and momentum of all of the particles of which the universe was made at the very beginning moment in time, or at any moment, you know, as, as soon as those were fixed and the laws of nature um, took over, that everything that was going to happen after that was already fixed. But as soon as you know, physics has kind of moved beyond this picture of time as an external parameter in the world. And this talk of the state of the world um, at one time is not actually well-defined in relativity. It is true, to be sure, that the um, that physicists you know, still do continue to, to treat the world as though it's a big object evolving over time and to speak of the global evolution of the world and to write down the laws uh, as you know, global laws of temporal evolution and partly because they think, well, you can, you know, what relativity tells us is that there isn't a well-defined global 
uh, state of the world at any given time, but there's a little bit of freedom in how we can slice up the world. It doesn't tell us that we have to, that we can't slice it up, only that there's a little bit of freedom. I think that's the wrong way to think. About it. I think what relativity showed us is that there isn't a well-defined, it's that this picture of the, of the universe as this, a big spatially extended object evolving over time is not right, that there is no well-defined global state of the world at a time. The intrinsic geometry of the world is a relativistic geometry. The laws are local, so now we can replace these global laws of temporal evolution that tell you what the state of the world at one time, how it relates to state another, and write them in a local form that tells you interaction by interaction, event by event, you know how one thing determines another. And it's true that it's going to be an artifact of those local laws, that if you do make a foliation, the classical laws, if you do carve the world up into time slices in um, any way, you're going to get global determinism. But we can understand the significance of that by looking, lo intera you know, looking interaction by interaction, event by event, what's actually going on in the kind of intrinsic causal structure of the world. And here's... What's interesting, if you take the world line of any kind of embedded system and you ask yourself, just paying attention to the, what relativity tells you, the set of events at any given time that can affect what goes on at that time, that, that counts as past at that moment, that is a set of events that, that you could possibly have in, information about at that moment. So what counts is your causal past, the set of events that could possibly affect what's happening at that moment. And you look even a finite fraction of a second into the future, and you ask, does the past determine the future, even given the deterministic laws? The answer is no. So the, so if you, if you really pay attention to what things look like from within the universe, and there is no outside the universe, what you get is a bunch of developing systems developing kind of asynchronously with respect to one another. So you have systems that, you know, are distance from one another. You can't talk in a well, relativistically well-defined way about what, what's happening now over there. You can just talk about, you know, the, the, you know, what's in my absolute past, what's in my absolute future, and what's in my absolute elsewhere. So the logic of past and future is a little bit different. It's not true, even though the laws are deterministic, that my past determines anything that happens in my future. And the same is true for every system in the world. So you have this kind of mesh-like network of systems developing, you know, sort of bringing in information that's e essentially unpredictable at every moment of their lives, incorporating it into their future. And so that if you, so it's as though I'm doing things over here, I'm creating information that will be a part of the future of systems over there. So that the whole thing is going to add up to a deterministic whole, but in no, at no, in in no life of any you know sort of actual embedded system is its past determining its future. There's always exogenous information that's relevant to what's going to happen that falls outside of its light cone. Hmm. Uh, that's a much more natural you know way of understanding what what the physics tells us. Um, but, you know, so, so that sort of moves questions of determinism, and this connects to the Sapolsky stuff. So that moves de questions of determinism, and I'm going way, way beyond what I did in my books. So, but the way, it's the way that I, think, that I think of it now, so it's hard for me not to want to say it <laughs> instead of going back to what I said. But I think um, there's another thing that is what I part of what I talked about in my book. We also bring to our understanding of the physics an understanding of physical laws is very different from what physics, um, you know, the way that physics has kind of matured. Like we tend to think of them as kind of relations of necessitation, like iron relations that that force us to, you know, to to that keep the world from doing one thing rather than another. But of course, that's not the way physics thinks of them. They're not laws; aren't causal agents. They capture regularities in what happens, universal regularities in what happens. So when you take those things out of the picture, you get the right picture of time. You know, it's very different from, from what the consequence argument um, suggests. Moreover, you know, think about the right analysis of what the fixity of the past amounts to. It's not like a metaphysical kind of, 
you know, fixity about the initial state of the universe. None of that stuff, that whole package of ideas is just an, is just a really poor shit for modern physics It's brought onto the physics and the understanding of the determinism from outside. So, but, but what it does do, um, it moves the whole discussion of determinism into the realm of, okay, so we're looking you know, from the point of view of the on the ground causal order, um, at at what you know what determines what in in the world, and I think what Sapolsky is doing is he's making it very vivid and very clear that if you pick out you know sort of take it doesn't do I mean I, what I like about the Sapolsky stuff is that it's not depending on any of these metaphysical ideas. You know, it's not depending on a, a view of time. It's not. He's saying if you pick out any human behavior and you ask yourself, what is the causal basis of that behavior? You can find at different time scales this whole layered structure of facts that um, that um, sort of that that go into shaping and um, and and influencing and ultimately he thinks determining. What that behavior will be. So he says, for example, you know, you make a decision to. Uh, this isn't an example of his. I can't think of his examples. You make a decision to um, to not work out today or something. I don't know, or um, or to eat to eat sweets. Let, let's say to eat a big piece of cake, even if you know you shouldn't have it. And he says, like, what is it that that you know, what is it in the world that makes that decision? You know, what, when and where was that decision made? And then he, he sort of says, well, you know, there are all of these events going on in your brain and the events that are going on in your brain are, you know, they have a causal history that partly de depends on the kind of chemical environment. And those have a causal history that partly depends on the, you know, uh, like facts in in your mother's womb when you you know you were developing and that and then you have genes and those depend on so he so you can sort of trace out you know the causal history of those behaviors in a, in a way that he seems to think crowds you out leaves no room for you where do you think that you get into it, into the picture yeah. so I think you know his book even though I mean all of the criticisms that people have made. Um, of it are right. He, um, I can say something about those, but you'll probably hear lots about those. But I think it makes this really useful point, which is, you know, it, it looks like if you look at the world through the lenses of the biologist, um, what you find when you look for the causal basis of human behavior are things like genes, hormones, um, you know, all of these factors that were shaped by evolutionary um, influences outside of your control long before you were ever on scene, many of them. And my response to all of that is, what do you think you are? You're some, you're a minded body. You're some mixture of genes and hormones and, you know, uh, chemistry that was partly the product of the early environment in the womb, plus personal experiences. You're all of that stuff. And when you make a decision, um, it does come from you if it comes from that stuff. You know, he's right that that um, if we want a notion of moral responsibility and um, it's going to have to recognize that, it shouldn't be founded on what he thinks free will would have to be, which is, you know, something coming from outside the causal order. You have to take seriously that that's what you are. You're a minded body and every part of you has a history. But I think, I mean, that... That shouldn't be surprising. It's not surprising to me if 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 someone has a notion of personal autonomy and moral responsibility that's incompatible with that, then I think their notion of personal autonomy is probably too strong and magical in some way. But I don't think any of the philosophers that think of themselves as compatibilists who have thought about free will, um, that they're seriously challenged by that. That was a great... Uh summary and, and rebuttal. And let me just make sure that I've put my finger on, on the crux of your argument. So what he believes, and it, he uses this anecdote from Henry James about turtles being all the way, it's turtles all the way down 
um, for us to have free will, there has to be a sort of free floating turtle that is you, that is, as you put it, free from the causal order that makes the decision sort of out of the blue, maybe in a, a dualist picture, uh, that you're going to have that cake or you're not going to work out. Whereas on your view, that just isn't what you are. Uh, you are not some, or uh, let me put it this way, in our folk intuition of what a person is, uh, or what a mind is, it is maybe this free-floating turtle. But what you are in actuality is a minded body, uh, and you are the sum of your hormones and their past and all of these things. And when a decision uh, flows out of all of these things. It is your decision, and that's where free will comes from. Yeah, I mean, it's a little stronger than that. I, you know, um, yeah, it's a little stronger than that because you do need to make a distinction between, you know, uh, sort of behaviors that I don't have voluntary control over mm -hmm. and behaviors that I do. So you need to understand a little bit about, you know, how it is that and this is something that Dennett will talk about and it's something that he's emphasized in contradict in in arguing specifically with Sapolsky's you need to understand how we evolved the ability to make decisions and that when i do make decisions you know those decisions to the extent that they come from my plans and priorities and projects and and yes i would say and the sort of person that i am including my disposition some of which were inherited some of which were formed in the womb and shaped by my experiences. So then they come from me. You know, it's Sapolsky who says, I mean, and this is all implicit in his argument. It's not something he says. And it's something that I think appeals to the idea a lot of people have of themselves, which is, you know, I'm somehow this indivisible locus of mental life distinct from brain and body and that um, but but the way it would, and so that's why it appeal Sapolsky's line of argument appeals to people. But what he actually says is, you know, he just describes, um, you know, sort of the way in which the you know behaviors are partly rooted in your genes, partly rooted in your hormones, partly rooted in your right, and then asserts, you know, there's effectively no room for me. That is, as if you absorb yourself completely into the fabric of the world um of course you're gonna your behavior to the extent that it comes from you is going to come from some of that stuff mm -hmm. so i you know it's it's a very seductive style of argument but he seems to think that look at the world i don't see me i see genes i see hormones i see and i see i see me that's what i am <laughs> what do you think you are you know um mm -hmm. and you know i'm not just a passive responder to um, you know, to forces that impinge on me. I make decisions and my decisions are partly based on, you know, and the, 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 the sort of cognitive apparatus that gives me a kind of internal locus of control. But it's not distinct from, you know, it's not separate from the natural order. It's part of it. Well, uh, two things. You mentioned uh, Dennett and I think his book, Freedom Evolves, is probably a, a good place for readers to get at this evolution of the decision-making apparatus. And then you also mentioned um, that we have this conception of ourselves as indivisible of the self as an indivisible locus of, I don't know. I don't know what it was of mental life. Yeah. I had a, a conversation with, one of Dan's collaborators at Tufts, Mike Levin, and he he stressed that he doesn't know of any uh, individual agents or intelligences. Everything is a collective. And if you're looking for a, fr a single free-floating turtle, you're just not going to find that anywhere. Uh, okay, so this part I disagree with, and I know you want to end, but this part I actually deeply disagree with. And it's um, so I think there is a kind of unity, a very special kind of unity that selves have and persons uh. have, and they have as a result of a kind of informational integration. And that when we say I, you know, that is a kind of unity, but it's not a material unity. It's not a unity that comes from the bottom up, and it's not a unity of matter. It's a, it's a special kind of unity that has to do 
with informational integration and synthesis, and it's a kind of, I mean, this part, my book is, you know, to a large extent, partly about this. And I think it's that informational unity that's, that's essential to the notion of a self as we use it. But, but it's very, but the, the seductive part uh, or the very difficult part of arguments, you know, against free will is exactly this. We look at the natural world and all we see are parts. We see little things and we see a causal order that, that, you know, is traces, but we don't see, you know, we don't see this indivisible loci of mental life. I think, I think there are, um, you know, there, there,